Knock, knock. Who's there? It's me, Hillary. Hi, Hillary. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, everyone listening, thank you so much for joining us for another episode. Uh, excited to dive into a uh, what I feel is going to be a really powerful conversation. And you're going to find out a whole lot about Hillary and her journey today. And particularly talking to everyone that's tuning in, and I know a lot of you are busy parents that you know, are overwhelmed and that are trying to fit things in around businesses and jobs and managing their kids and being great parents. And, you know, all the people that we talk to in our audience, the members we train every day at the Knock Academy. And Hillary is also one of those people. <laughs> and what you've been able to do is incredible. And we're going to talk a little bit about your journey and also your book that's coming up really soon in August and um, which talks all about this journey. So, Share a little bit more about Hillary. Share a little bit about kind of you, where you're at. Talk a little bit about the book, and then we'll kind of dive into some some specific topics from there. Okay, so I'm Hillary Topper, and I wrote a book. It's called From Couch Potato to Endurance Athlete, A Portrait of a Non-Athletic Triathlete, which is me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, in my... Uh, what I do for real life is I have a PR firm and I also am a blogger. I'm a full-time blogger. I have two blogs, atriathletesdiary.com, where I talk about everything triathlon related because that is my love. That is my passion like you guys. And I also have a blog called hillarytopper.com, which is a lifestyle blog. I'm a podcaster. I also am a teacher at Hofstra University. I am an adjunct there and I teach digital marketing. And I'm also a coach like you. I have a running group. We do the run walk method. And um, yeah, and I'm USA certified. So, you know, I just thought it would be, you know, good for me to have that as part of my blog. So that's, you know, that's pretty much my, my gamut. Um, in terms of getting started, I started a business when I turned 30 and I put my whole life into this business and I grew the business. I had about 25 people working for me in my PR firm. But at one point, you know, as I was growing, I started not feeling happy with myself. I was a total couch potato. I would go to business, you know, lunches, breakfast, dinner, networking parties, drinking a lot, partying a lot, you know, meeting people. And I was just drinking and eating and getting fat and thinking, oh, what am I doing here? How am I going to change my life, right? So I used to go, there's this parkway here on Long Island. I live on Long Island in New York. And there's this parkway called the Wantour Parkway. And you, I would watch as the runners and the cyclists would go by. I would just stop the car in the middle of the parkway, like right, you know, on the shoulder. <laughs> and I would stop and I'd watch. And I, you know, I would like to do that one day. Now I'm 48 years old. Okay. I'm, you know, I'm old already to start running and getting into fitness and exercise. I decide I'm going to join a gym. So I joined New York sports club and the trainer walks me through all the equipment, shows me how to do everything. And the next day he says, all right, come in at eight o'clock warm up on the treadmill, and then we'll do the weight stuff together. So I walk in there. I have absolutely no clue what to do, how to turn on a treadmill. I mean, I didn't even know what to do with the treadmill. Like, what do you do? Do you, you how do you turn it on? Why do you, what do you, <laughs> you know, it's like I was coming from nowhere. And, you know, somebody obviously showed me how, and that's really where it started. And I started getting into running and from there, from running my first mile on the treadmill, I tried running outside and, you know, as you know, outside's a lot different than running on yep. a treadmill. So I, you know, did my first 5k and did my second, you know, did a 10k after that and, 
finally did have marathons and marathons and et cetera. And then at some point I was doing the um, Brooklyn half marathon with my, my friend and we were doing all of these, you know, half marathon and, you know, races together. And she said to me, after the, when we finished, and we both had a PR on this race, we both did great on this race. I mean, I was like, you know, I am so psyched. I want to keep doing it. And she says to me, I don't want to do these anymore. These races are horrible. I don't, I just don't want to do these anymore. So I said to her, out of the blue, I said, why don't we try a triathlon? Now, I, I never saw a triathlon. I didn't even know what a triathlon was. I didn't know that. I mean, I kind of had an idea that it was swim, bike, run, but I had no idea. <laughs> so she says to me, well, we have to hire a coach. And we ended up going with different coaches. And I was going to this one coach who was very, he was, you know, very stern and, <laughs> you know, really was like a drill sergeant type of guy, you know, and, um, you know, he definitely whipped me into shape. I mean, and I was able to compete in my first triathlon with her in Florida, which was another random thing. Like usually you'd pick a race close to home. No, we'd have to, we have to go to Florida. Race. <laughs> good, good idea for a, good idea for a vacation stroke triathlon. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I, I love that. I want to, I want to rewind a touch because I have a few questions that I think are going to be really important. I love that there was this, um, I love that you share that kind of step-by-step -step journey. I think that's really important when we talk about anyone's health and fitness journey, because people see the triathlete, whatever level of triathlete you are, whether you're not athletic or you're a professional <laughs> is they see the triathlete and they, they find it hard to comprehend what got that person to that point. So I talk a lot in coaching about, you know, small measurable actions, right? It's small little things that we can do that we can measure. And you spoke about kind of joining the gym and stepping in the gym for the first time. I'd love to hear kind of the, a little bit more about that process. I think that's a scary thing. And whether somebody's joining a gym in person, they're coming online or they're joining a running club or they're doing something athletic, some sort of sport is there's typically this kind of, for most people, this mental kind of emotional journey to get you to that point, to walk in the door. And I've had consultations of people when I worked in the gym where it took them three weeks just to show up for the appointment, you know, of canceling it, rebooking it and not showing. And was that something that you experienced going, kind of going into that? Or was it just kind of, are you a split second kind of person? I'm going to the gym today and walk in the door. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing of it is, right, is you go into the gym and you see all these beautiful people and everybody's dressed to the max. You know, it's not like you're, you know, they're wearing ripped jeans, you know, it's not like... <laughs> Everybody's wearing these like really hot outfits and I wasn't hot, you know? So <laughs> I was like a little intimidated. I was a lot intimidated, uh, you know, and I felt uh, very uncomfortable, you know? And I think that that was, that's something, you know, I think you nailed it there because that is something that when you're not in this world and you enter this world, you have this perception that everybody's beautiful and fit and, you know, and, and yet when you do triathlons, you realize that they are, they come in and even running events that everybody comes in different shapes and sizes. I mean, they're heavy, they're small, they're a medium built. It doesn't really matter. We're all out there. We're all trying to do this for ourselves. Now, I think that the one thing for me was that I don't know that, you know, when we signed up for this triathlon, I wasn't really thinking about the swim, right? Like, I, oh, you know, I know how to doggy paddle. I mean, what do you need to... <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize that I did not know how to swim. I never put my face in the water. Never. I never, I never put my head in the water. Like, I... I would go in the water with my family. I would dunk and I would come out and sit in the sun. Yeah. <laughs> that was my, <laughs> that Sounds was familiar. my water. <laughs> yeah. 
so this was so so going to the pool for the first time was also very intimidating when i swam my first lap i couldn't swim a lap i couldn't even get across the pool without throwing up three times i mean i kept swallowing water i was i didn't i didn't know that you're supposed to wear goggles i mean or a bathing cap or yeah i didn't have any of that stuff <laughs> so, yeah well and it is a uh, it, it's like you said it's very similar right it's a very similar um process that we feel intimidated that one thing that kind of comes up for me there which which is definitely not to deny anyone yours or anyone else's reality of stepping into a gym or a sport environment for the first time and, and having that perception that maybe there's lots of fit athletic people with nice outfits and nice bodies and whatever it might be as we create this picture now i always refer to this when i talk about the intimidation of those environments is you will see what you're looking for so it's a bit like if you you what decide you want to buy a yellow car you'll start seeing yellow cars everywhere okay it's a bit like if i say don't think don't think about an elephant with pink spots you know, purple elephant with pink spots, you start thinking about it. So what happens is we go in the gym and we tell ourselves this story or we go in the pool, and we tell ourselves this story that everyone's going to be an, an Olympic swimmer. And then suddenly you see all the people that are Olympic swimmer, you know, they look like them or they move like them. The people in the gym, you see all of those people that have clearly worked out for many years and we don't know their journey, like I mentioned earlier, and we, we see what we're looking for. And, and that's such an important thing because it is, you know, the, the lens we see the world through is, is will really impact those initial kind of experiences wherever we go. You're absolutely spot on. And the other thing is that we often compare ourselves with other people, right? I mean, that becomes like a big thing when you're, you become an athlete, right? You're looking at other people's times. You're looking at Strava. You're seeing people come in at five, six, seven minutes in a mile, and you're coming in like 13, 14, 15 minute miles, you know? <laughs> and it's like, oh my God, you know, like yeah. how slow am I? But the thing of it is, is that it's you. You're competing against yourself. You're not competing against anybody else. And nobody really cares. I mean, that's the thing. Like, you think that everybody cares. You think everybody's looking at you and thinking, oh, my God, that's a really terrible athlete. But they're not. They're looking at themselves. They're comparing. And it's so funny because the more people or more elite athlete you get, the more insecure people are. I mean, they're insecure about their, own, you know, just different things that they have going on. So, we all have that insecurity and we all have that, you know, so it's, it's, it's really just looking within and, and getting that power from within to do and accomplish what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the, the truth of it is someone's opinion. I mean, unless it's someone that you massively value, but someone in the gym that you've never met and you might never see again, really who cares. And, and as you said, even the fittest, strongest, and most athletic looking with the best outfit they've also got as you said their own securities and they're bothered for whatever their reasons are wherever their insecurities come from we all have them and that's that's what people are focused on and don't think like you said someone that's clocking those times in a race of some description is bothered about you they're just bothered about beating their next time or you know qualifying for that event so uh, what we perceive to be people's focus is typically not the case and i talk about this online all the time i'm like log on in your pajamas for all i care i don't care like get up at 6 six twenty seven and log on for a six thirty workout if your kids and your pets are running around in the background i don't care and no one else does like i don't care if you're here and you're moving and that's benefiting your life great like show up who as who you are from wherever you are and it's okay no one really cares and no one's paying attention because it's 6 30 in the morning <laughs> So, so impactful so uh, i love that i think that's firstly really powerful for anyone that's getting started on their journey and the other i think the other types of people that you know i come into contact a lot of the people that are overwhelmed with the enormity of goals and what happens is we get paralyzed by inaction and we kind of think it through and we look at all the data and the research and we find all these different ways and we have the perfect program yet without taking that initial action and getting that forward momentum, we typically don't get the motivation. Motivation typically comes from taking action. Now, you obviously mentioned going to the gym and, you know, doing that and, and finding this time to train for your events. 
what I'd love to hear a little bit about, and you touched on it, you know, and you, you shared very kindly about kind of running a business and the things that you're working in. It sounds as though you're very um, active in your life and not just physically active, but active in all the things you're doing. You're also a parent. So, you know, you're, you're in that category with myself and many of, you know, the people listening today, where did you, I'm going to position this question very carefully um, <laughs> on purpose. Where did you find the time to start going to the gym? Where did you find the time to train for a triathlon? I imagine there's a lot of hours in a week. A lot um, of just, hours. Yeah. Where do, you, where do you find time? Like what time management skills do you have? And how did you bring that all together to be able to get to the place you're at? You know, it's funny because when I first started, I kind of just juggled it in where I could, right? And as time went on, and people think I'm absolutely out of my mind, like you're talking about 6.30 in the morning, right? I get up at four o'clock <laughs> and I'm out at the, in the open water by 5, 5.30, right? Or I'm on the bike path at, you know, 5.30 in the morning. I mean, it's right now, it's just become part of my life. And one of the things that I realized about this whole thing is that throughout my whole journey, right, through having a business, through taking care of my kids, through even taking care of my parents, and my, my parents, I mean, they weren't old, but they were sickly, you know, so for a while, I was kind of like in that sandwich generation, taking care of my kids, taking care of my parents, taking care of my business, making sure that everybody in my business was getting fed, you know, and it was a lot of pressure on me. And I realized through this journey that when I get up at five o'clock in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, and I get out of the house at 5.30 and I'm on that path and I'm watching the sunrise or I'm swimming in the open water and the sun is rising and it's just a magnificent day. I think to myself, this is my time this is for me. I'm doing this for me because I love this. You know, it's just something that makes me happy. And it's the only time of the day that I'm seriously happy. Like I walk around, so I'm like, you know, if you follow my Instagram page, I have like the happy dance, you know, I'm just going crazy in my, you know, in my world with my wetsuit on or, you know, because it's, it's just something that makes me happy. And then I know that throughout the whole day, whatever happens, the kids, I got to deal with, you know, this or that or the other thing or work or whatever, I can get through it. I, you know, because I, I had my me time. That was my time. Yeah. I, uh, I always share in the mornings, uh, in the morning workouts with our members that it, it, either you got up and you were fired up and this was an incredible workout or it was horrible. You didn't enjoy it, but it will be the toughest thing you've completed all day and everything else will seem you know, a little bit easier to, to, to navigate, right? Whatever that is, whatever, whatever crap life throws at you, you're going to go, Oh, you know what? I was up. I got up. I did my workout, right? It's that sense of achievement and success. Um, so I, I love that mentality because we do have that me time, but I'm sure that many of those sessions you do Hillary are not always super enjoyable because I imagine there's some real tough <laughs> sessions getting in that open water early in the morning when it's cold and you're tired um, and we have to find those ways to navigate that stuff so I love that you're able to connect all the pieces there it, it, that's super important and it, it also talks to finding things you love to do yeah. I mean, it does scare the piss out of me. I mean, every single workout, I think, oh my God, am I going to be able to do that? I've got a three hour bike today and I've got intervals in between. Oh my God. Like, how can I do that? But you do it. And then when you finish it, you'll feel like, yeah, I did it. Yeah. And you said an important thing there when you finish it, you'll get that feeling of I did it that success and this is what I always talk about is yes find things you love but sometimes we love the feelings and the emotions things bring because people say oh you can't just love every workout or it's and I'm like yeah you don't because I don't love all my workouts um I love a lot of them but what I do love is how I feel and what I get from it so when you hook into that that's majorly important so I think you know that's an important thing for everybody to hear and one thing I want to ask, because I know that there's people listening right now that are probably thinking, I'm already tired. 
I'm already overwhelmed. I've already got so much on my plate. How do I possibly f- go and do a workout in this position? Like I don't, I'm going to be more tired. I'm going to be uh, more overwhelmed. I'm going to be more stressed trying to fit that in. And there's going to be people thinking that. I'd love to hear what you would say to those people if they said that to you. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are a lot of people who say that. They People do say that to me. I mean, that's typical. Like, how do you get it all done? How do you... Yeah, you figure it out. But the thing of it is, is that like what you said, you know, you get it done and you you let that stress go. You know, it just goes. And you need that time just to get rid of it. Now, when you're finished with the workout, you're exhilarated. I mean, you feel so good. You, you feel like you can get through the day. And yeah, okay. Let me just tell you, I do fall asleep at like eight <laughs> o'clock at night. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Thank God my kids are older, so it's, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. When they were little, they, they'd keep me up. I'd be like, oh, just go to bed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I hear you completely. I, um, I quite often, so our, our cutoff time is 7.30 in our house. So our daughter's in bed and then 7.30, mommy or daddy, whoever's on bedtime that day leaves the room and then she's, she's either, she's falling asleep or then she falls asleep. There's many times where she'll like nudge me when I'm lying down next to her, when I've been singing songs, she's like, daddy, why are you not singing? And I'm like, oh, um, uh, and I've fallen asleep. So I totally get that. And that's at 7.30. And then I've got, then I've got to go and get other stuff done uh, before I go to bed. But yeah, you make a, you raise a great point about, you know, yes, you, you'll find that and you feel exhilarated. Now, I think the follow on question for that is that someone that's thinking I'm already tired, do you find that when you don't train on days, you don't train or you have a break or something gets in the way, is do you feel more energetic on those days or do you feel less energetic? Way less energetic. Oh, yeah. I feel terrible. Like my body, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier in this interview, I had COVID like the last couple of weeks. It's yeah. just, you know, and I didn't train as much as I normally do. And my body was it hurt me. Like I just, I had to get out and walk. I mean, just do something. Yeah. I needed to move my body. You have to move your body. I mean, this is what we're meant to do, you know? And it just, it makes you feel so much better. And I think it does help you recover from anything that you go through, you know? Like I also had knee surgery for meniscus, you know? And that was like, traumatic for me but at least I was able to get into the pool or I was able to go on the bike I mean the run suffers <laughs> and it's still suffering but it, it, I'll come back it'll be back you know um yeah 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 I, I love that and it's so true and, and I was I didn't know what you were going to say as the answer to that question but I was hoping that's what you'd say but it's so true because I get that all the time people are like I'm just I'm tired I don't have any energy it's going to tie me out I'm like Actually, it won't. You'll get to that slump in the middle of your day and you'll you'll cruise through that having got that workout in at lunchtime and, um, you know, in the middle of the day or early in the morning. And in our market, we we I'm a big advocate of morning workouts, but I'm also a big advocate of doing it before life gets in the way. And that could be that could be 6.30 in the morning. It might also be 9.30 after you dropped your kids off at school. And we actually only run sessions in our business. Our schedule only runs from 6.30 in the morning until like 1.00. Because I know from personal experience training people for 20 years that people that have got that kind of lifestyle and have got kids to pick up from school and then that chaos of like, get the kids, activities, dinner, bedtime, like those people are not working out at 9 p.m. at night. They're not working out at 7 p.m. at night there. So we purposely front loaded the, the, our schedule for that exact reason. And it allows people to do what they need to do, get that movement in, be successful, and then get through the rest of that day and then have that wind down time, right? Because basically, really, honestly, having young kids, you, you put your kids to bed and then you pretty much just wind up and go to bed. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, definitely. You de- I, I need to get it done first thing in the morning. It's almost like, you know, like when I talk to like a new runner, right? There's this woman I'm, I'm helping out, I'm coaching her and she's brand new and she's never run a day in her life. And she's like, what should I do? And ha- I said to her, you know, and she said, oh, I tried to get out the door, but then I had all these distractions. I said to her, look, 
what you do is you lay out your clothes the night before. You do everything the night before. Everything is all set. So you don't even think. You have the coffee going so that that morning you just pull it out. You got to have a cup of coffee. You're done. You know, I mean, you got to think ahead a little bit. Just plan ahead so that you could get it done and then go on with your day and, and be productive and, and feel clear headed and, you know, really do what you want need to do yeah the re- i always say the only real excuse is i didn't get up like the your only obstacle is i didn't get up like that's it there is no other obstacle at that time of the day and this is also why i like to work or either i either walk in the mornings with the dog and listen to a podcast or right yes. or a few days a week I'll, I'll get up and i'll work early and people always ask why i do that i'm like because do you know who distracts you at five in the morning no one literally there's there's i maybe see one other person walking their dog i live in a small town but um you know one other person walking their dog a few cars or i'm working and there's no emails no text messages no notifications nothing's happening at that time of the day and everyone in my house is asleep so it's the perfect time to get things done and that's why i'm a big advocate of it there's less gets in the way and you really did nail all the uh if we can call them hacks to getting it done in the morning, lay your clothes out, put the coffee machine on, like do all those things that are going to spur you into it. And I always laugh that we have an even bigger advantage with what we do at the Knock Academy because you don't even have to go anywhere. You just have to, turn, you just have to literally either open the app and log in or open your laptop and log on. And that's it. You just go to your space, wherever you do your workout, wherever that might be. And you just log on and people li- literally, they're like, I know they've just got up. Like they're like still pulling on their like, pulling on their top over their sports bra logging on at the same time like ready to go 629 so and and what that does is it gives people you know and it's not for everybody i totally appreciate that but it it takes out one more barrier takes out that 15 minute drive to the gym right or whatever it might be Um, and so whatever barriers you can remove and if it's working out early it might be you know trying to schedule that lunch break in your calendar and doing it then whatever that looks like but we have to and I dislike the term of, and I purposely asked it like this earlier, but we don't find time. What we do is prioritize the time we have and we have to figure that out. And it sounds like that's exactly what you've done. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now you touched a little bit on, um, we touched on the kind of journey and those progressions and obviously that, you know, the new runner that you referred to, but you also mentioned your knee injury. I'd love to hear, this is something that comes up a lot with people when I think we all fall in the trap of that kind of defeatist attitude when we get injured. And it is a common thing when we start something, especially if we start something new, not guided by a coach or by a professional. So that's a you know a big piece of advice is to get that. But how did that affect you mentally going for surgery, having that period of time out? How do you deal with that? Well, it was really heartbreaking for me because I was training for a half Ironman and it was my first. I had actually signed up for four prior to, and every time I signed up for one, something would happen and I wasn't able to do it. So this time, this was my fourth, (laughs) I signed up paid my $400 or whatever it was, 500, you know, Ironman is like ridiculous amount of money. And I was on my bike. I did a 60 mile bike ride and I was running off the bike and I was on the boardwalk in Jones beach, which is right on the water. It's beautiful. Anyway. So I just heard a, it, it was like half mile in. I, I heard that and I knew that something was really wrong. And I went into a, I went into a definitely a depression out of it. But you know, the thing of it is, is that as an athlete, we all get injured, right? That's something, it's part of life. It's just part of who we are. And we just need to just kind of grin and bear it and try to do other things that we can do, like not take that as, you know, a defeatist attitude, like, okay, now I can't run. Now I'm not going to do anything. You know, I mean, some people will do that. You know, there's this one woman who I, I work with, she's in my running group and, you know, she's got arthritis in her knee and she says she can't run now. So, you know, I'm trying to like talk her into doing other things. Okay. Get out there and swim or get out there and get a bike or do something, you know, don't, don't just let this define who you are because you can't, you know, you you got to move forward. You got to be healthy. You got to think about yourself and how you can get through this. 
And that's basically what happened with me with, you know, the knee. I mean, I was out of commission fully for about two weeks, I guess. And then I was able to get in the pool, which was fantastic. And, you know, I just love the feeling of being in the water now. I mean, from, from not being a swimmer at all to now just like gliding through the water and, and that feeling it's just such a peaceful, amazing feeling to be in the water, you know, so I'm grateful that I was able to do that. And then I was able to get onto the bike pretty quick too. So that was good. Nice. Um, and that's great to hear. And I think, uh, you know, useful for people because we do suffer those things and maybe it's not, you know, torn meniscuses and whatever and surgery, but you know, there's many other things, right. That, that oh. come up and it's those little shoulder niggles, those little ankle niggles, those little injuries, or those, just those restrictions that we naturally have, you know, whether it's from a surgery, from an injury or just, you know, it, it, within our own bodies, what I think it speaks to. And I kept my, my mind kept drifting towards when you were talking there was, the all or nothing mentality that a lot of us get stuck in. And I will not that I mean to criticize all men listening, but I feel like women do this too, but men definitely um, <laughs> fall into this all or nothing. And a lot of men I've coached in the past are if they can't work out hard, you know, let's say they plan on doing five days a week and eating this perfect nutrition and doing all these things. It's, if one little obstacle comes up, like you get that work meeting that interferes with your workout, you plan to do it later in the day and you don't get to it. And then your nutrition falls off because you were at a meeting and you ate, you know, maybe food that was supplied. And then it's like everything deteriorates around that one little blip. And it falls on that all or nothing mentality. And I feel like we just do this... Uh, in life and like I, I just refer to it as men because i think it's funny because I, we always have this conversation with my male friends that we do this all the time even though we know better and i feel like we all do it as a as a you know as human beings however it you know it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on where you think it comes from in you know in athletic endeavors but also you know how have how have you kind of navigated that all or nothing mentality just within your training not necessarily around injuries but just as you approach your training is it something that comes up and do you have any little tools in your toolbox to to navigate that well I, 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 so in my book right I, I really talk about like all of the injuries that i got like i i've i've had a lot of different like silly you know injuries like Achille achilles tendonitis and plantar fasciitis and all that kind of stuff broke my toe a couple of times you know stupid things that come up and you know and and set you back but the thing of it is is that it you have to think about it as a moment right like you know we're on this journey and it's just a moment in time, right? So we, we get injured. Well, maybe there's something else that we can do. Maybe there's something else that we could focus on. Maybe, you know, if we can't do a swim, bike, run, maybe we could just do a yoga session or something that would help us to move a little bit and just keep that blood circulating. Um, you know, and, and I, I'll tell you, it, it's funny because, you know, reading the book, going back and looking at this journey, and it's it's about a 10 year journey through, you know, from, you know, learning how to run and learning how to swim and even learning how to bicycle ride because I, I grew up right in, in, the, in a town called Long Beach, which is where I am right now. And in this town, we are on, we are sea level and there's a boardwalk. So we, people ride their board, their bike on the boardwalk and we go like five miles an hour, you know? So I thought that was riding a bike. I didn't realize, you know, that you do like 15, 20 miles an hour <laughs> and, and you shift gears too, and you have yeah. to shift. <laughs> so, you know, so I talk about all of that. And then I talk about all the injuries and, you know, just obstacles I've, I've there's so many things. I mean, it's not just injuries. You, you can face so many obstacles in your life. I mean, you know, my mother passed away when I was, you know, training for a bunch of things and that set me back. And then I had my sister who was my absolute best friend. She suddenly has a brain aneurysm and stroke and she, she's in the hospital with tubes all over her for three weeks. And then she dies. I mean, she, she's 59 years old. And I also signed up for an Ironman and everything. 
So it's not just injuries. It's, it's things that happen to you personally. Like you, there's so many things that happen and it's hard to get through it. But when you realize that working out and doing these kinds of things will help you not only physically, but also mentally, that's when you realize that it's, it's really important to do this. I mean, this should be the, the priority. I mean, <laughs> I'm the big advocate for this, but I really do feel that way, that, that, that working out and getting out there and doing what's good for you is going to be good for your kids. It's going to be good for your, you know, your spouse. It's going to be good for everybody. Because if you are happy, everybody's going to be happy. Yeah. Yeah. I love the, I love the idea or how you put it that all those things that come up, those we'll call them adversities, whether they be mental, physical, emotional, whatever it is, they come up and they are a moment. And this is where we get stuck. Right. And I like that, that quote sometimes is, you know, did you, did you have a crappy day or did you have a crappy five minutes and you let it become a crappy day? And, and, and that's not to take away from our need to grieve things, especially if it's loss, you know, thank you for sharing that by the way, um, is, you know, yes, we need our time to do those things. However, they are moments in time and they don't affect the necessarily the long-term outcome of what we're trying to achieve. And, and this is so true. Like one, you know, one crappy meal, doesn't define your nutritional habits one really good meal doesn't define it either right same as one good workout doesn't one bad workout whatever it might be so we have to think about rather than that all or nothing mentality is we are what we do consistently right and that's my that's been my way of managing that with a you know living i've lived a life of a bit of an all or nothing mentality some perfectionism through you know stuff imprinted on me growing up and that's something that i've really navigated and i, and I love that the way you put it actually it's a nice simple approach that it's just a moment and you know everything around that is still still remains uh, so i think that's really powerful and yeah we you know we all go through those things and it, you know whatever it looks like there's going to be adversities and someone one of my really good friends has this quote where he believes that we should be creating adversity to some respect because it builds who we are and you know when we and what he means by that is not actually physically making things terrible happen but to go out and live your life where we take risks and we dream and we get out of our comfort zone because those things shape us and they create those adversities right because you're going to go out and decide hey i'm just going to uh, go do a triathlon not not everyone does that like you hillary but um <laughs> some people do and when we do that and we just, i'm just going to do this is you know what you are going to fail you are going to get injured you are going to have crappy days all those things, right? So we're creating those adverse things that happen in life. We overcome them. And, you know, hopefully we get to that end result like you have, being able to do those things and be successful in them, even within the challenges. And as we said earlier, right, the journey is, you know, people's journey is not always apparent for everybody to see, but yeah, they can be, uh, they can be challenging for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You so know, it, even, even with business though, like, you know, what you were saying, you know, just jumping into starting a business, a lot of people won't start a business. They'll just dwell on it. They just won't. I'm not ready. I don't know if I could do this. I'm not, you know, I'm not really an entrepreneur. And sometimes you just got to jump in and just <laughs> jump into that dirty water. You know, that's, this was, this is actually a great quote that somebody said to me I was doing the uh New York City triathlon it was right before and I was so nervous about jumping in the Hudson River I mean you know I, I I would think everybody knows that that Hudson River is not the cleanest in the world <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I kept thinking if I jump in what if what if I bump into a dead body floating in the water like what am I getting right that was one of the thoughts. And then the other thought I kept having about that triathlon was the hills. Um, the Henry Hudson Parkway is pretty hilly. It's very hilly. And I was so scared about like going up the hills. And my and a woman who I mean, you know, was in business with, she was uh, my client. And this is actually in the book. It's I talk about this in the book. She says to me, Hillary weren't you always jumping into dirty water? 
aren't you always climbing up hills? I mean, this is what you do in business, right? This is what you do. And it was like a aha moment. Like I could get through this, you know, like she's right. So. Yeah, it's so true. And it, and it, it really talks to the, when we are confident in what it is we're navigating, we have a very different approach, but to your point, it's no different. It really is no different. It's just that we've done it so many times. We feel confident about it and it, it really shapes our, shapes our mindset and I had an interesting conversation with my business coach last week and it was funny because I was basically sharing that the I get overwhelmed and anxious by the thought of we were talking about getting out there and having conversations and building you know more awareness in the community and how that's really going to benefit our business and I was just saying that the thought of that overwhelms me a lot and it it's not that I have an issue holding a conversation because I do it all day for a job. I just going into an environment where I don't know people and having to create that overwhelms me and I get anxious about it. However, I'll stand on a stage and present at a conference in front of thousands of people. It doesn't bother me, but I didn't get there. I didn't, I wasn't just suddenly good at that. Like it took practice, right? I had to jump in the, the dirty water, so to speak. And I had to try those things out and I had to be brave and take it. But for some reason, because I knew what I was talking about and I had confidence about it, I did it. But when I refer it to a different environment, when I have to go talk to people I don't know about something or just build community, because I'm not really necessarily going there to talk about fitness. I'm going there to make connections. And that I find a bit more awkward. And she's like, it's the same thing. I'm like, it but is. it's not. And she's like, it is. And, and I was like, yeah, okay, you're right. It is. And she's like, you are good at that. You're just telling yourself you're not. And that's what's causing it. I was like, I was like, screw you. You're right. And then that was... Uh, <laughs> It's really a good point. I think that, you know, I used to feel that way. Like every time I would walk into one of these rooms where I had to network, you know, and give out your business. I always hated those things. You have to give out your business cards to everybody. And hi, I'm Hillary Topper. Nice to meet you, you know. And, yeah. and the thing of it is, is before I would go into those meetings, I would start to do like a little self-talk. I mean, this might sound crazy, but I would say to myself, I'm good. I'm good at what I do. I, you know, I love myself. I'm good at what I do. I can do this. I, I got this, right? And it's the same thing when you're doing one of these events, you know, these running events or these triathlon events. I'm good. I got this. It's okay. You know what? If I finish last, I finish last. It doesn't matter. I finished, you know, I got there. I got to the start line. I'm going to get to the finish line and that's it, you know, and that's, that's what you got to think. Yeah. And I think that applies to, like we said, the working out, the making that first step, the starting on your fitness journey. It's the same thing. Maybe we, if we framed it as I'm going to go in the gym today and if I do five minutes and that's enough and I go home, great. I've done really well. And I am, that's okay. I can go in there and I can do that. And like you said, you know, or it's that I'm going to finish last or, you know, whatever that might look like is we, we kind of frame that and, it's so important because that in itself build builds habits. And it, I love one of my favorite books of all time is Atomic Habits by James Clear. And uh, he tells a great story in there. It's one of my favorites where he tells a story about the guy building habit to go to the gym. And he starts out by getting in his car, driving to the gym, parking in the parking lot, and then starting the car up and driving home. And it seems wild that that would create a success. He's like, we're not even going in there or doing anything. And he did that for a week. Then he would go inside the gym and he'd spend five minutes in the gym without doing any exercise. Then the week after he went in and he did five minutes like on the bike. And then suddenly within two, two months, he's up to that full goal. And the, the, you know, the, I can't remember the timeline, but the story goes on that this person's now a lifelong exercise exerciser because taking those actions to who you want to become, right? Every little action builds that. And that's so important for building confidence. And, and like you said, it's about how we frame it, right? If we frame, we're going to go in with the all or nothing mentality again. That's where we struggle to be consistent and build that confidence. And, you know, I think about it with my career. You know, I mentioned being able to stand up and do something in front of thousands of people is it was it, and not knowingly. I just went through this process. You start teaching a few classes to a few people. Then those classes get a bit bigger and they get a bit more popular. And then suddenly you're in front of other professionals, not just consumers. I didn't just turn up one day and go, Oh, I'm just going to present at this fitness conference and be in front of thousands of people. That's not how it works, right? It's a process. And so, yeah, it's all, I love how we're bringing this full circle back to what we started with. Um, and it, and it is really is that process and that building of consistency. So uh, I love, love where we went with that today. Um, 
can you tell us a little bit more um, about the uh, about when the book is released, where people can find it, who it's yeah. for? And uh, yeah, share a bit more of that and tell us the title again to remind everybody as well. Sure. Thank you very much for that. So um, the name of the book is From Couch Potato to Endurance Athlete. And that's probably, if you just remember from endurance, from couch potato to endurance athlete, the rest of it, you'll yeah. find, you'll see my name, Hillary Topper. You could pre-order the book right now on Barnes and Noble and Amazon, and it's available in Canada, UK, and the USA. Um, or you can get it at Barnes and Noble, and it's also, you know, around the world. Um, my publisher is Meyer and Meyer Sports, and what's really cool about them is that they also publish publish Jeff Galloway's books, and I'm a big fan of his. Um, the book will be released on August 1st, and I'm doing a bunch of book tours around the country. Um, my first stop is in Boca Raton, Florida, which I will be doing a two-mile ocean swim. And the day before, I'll be at the Barnes & Noble signing books. And um, uh, Bole uh, uh, Fresh and Bold Kitchen is my sponsor for that. And they're going to be giving out coupons and cookies. And so it's going to be a really fun day. And then after that, we're doing a bunch in New York, Long Island, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I'm not, I don't have anything booked for Canada. I would love to come to Toronto if I could get Barnes & Noble there. <laughs> But, um, you know, so mostly on the uh, Midwest, I'm doing a bunch in Denver, um, Boulder, um, you know, it's all on my website. If you go to atriathletesdiary.com, it's atriathletesdiary.com, and you look and you just click on the link that says book. It'll take you to the whole tour. You can click on the all the links. I have every single link for every book company that is it has the book, and uh, yeah, and it, it'll be released, uh, you know, across the world August first. You know, nice. the book publishing company is in Germany, so it's going to be in German, um, England, Australia. You know. Oh, Lovely. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. And and sounds like a lot of fun kind of touring out there and just, just getting connected with people that want to read the book. And for everyone listening, I will make sure all of that is in the show notes. So there'll be simple one click to take you to the page and, you know, where you can get the book, et cetera. Um, I'm a big audio book fan. Is it going to be an audio version? Yes, actually yes. there is an audio book, a book edition. I recorded it myself. Oh, nice. Oh my God. <laughs> there are parts of it where I'm actually crying. You will hear me crying. Oh, oh my God. But, um, it's really powerful and the audio version is going to be really cool. And that's going to also be released August 1st. So you can get that on audible and, you know, nice. I'm going to put it on my wish list on Audible and I'm going to listen when it comes out. I can't wait. That will be my morning walks. Um, <laughs> that's so good. And it, I'm, I'm assuming just from, you know, a little bit of my understanding of kind of your journey and the stories that this is really a book for, you know, what we think we spoke about today. So it could relate to being that, that non-athletic, you know, triathlete or whatever it might be making that transition from not moving and being active to being moving. But who else would you say it applies to? I'm going to say it probably is a good read for anybody. However, who would you say are they kind of target people that are going to get so much from it? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that it really is a book for anybody who, you know, even an Iron Man would enjoy the book because it's it they'll it'll remind them of their journey. But <clears throat> it it's really for anybody who feels like they were always pushed down their whole lives and they can't it's a book that will help people realize that they can well that what else can we say that's a pretty powerful message right there and uh, I, I love that and you know we really are we are the creators of our own destiny so um you know and anything that supports that journey will we will be really powerful as i said i will make sure everything is in the show notes for anyone listening today and i recommend you definitely go check out the book check out hillary's website all the amazing things that she's doing um you know in the world of triathlon and movement but also just in in business in you know all the other things you do you've got some other incredible stuff so please go check that out Hilary, it's been a pleasure. Your energy is infectious. It's been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed it. I've got a lot and I love kind of just 
spitballing around those ideas and you know connecting all the dots so it's been incredible thank you so much for joining us thank you so much i really appreciate you having me of course and everyone listening thank you so much for tuning in we really appreciate it look the world of podcasting it goes around with the support of everyone who tunes in and shares these episodes. If you got a lot about this today, you know, someone's really going to love the book and love this conversation. Please share it with that person because it really does help us build the podcast. That's it for today's episode. We hope that you have an incredible day, hour, week, month, whatever it is till we catch you again. And we will be back with another amazing episode next week.